This is you to slow up, so remember you went to the Uh, when can I start? Uh, okay. <clears throat> Dear panel, we want to be very clear from the outset what this debate is about. We don't. We think that oppositions will agree with us that, state, that the state should have some income from selling natural resources within their territory. We think that, that it, uh, if they're not, I would love a clarification about this specific issue. But obviously, we think that today we tax natural resource, uh, the production of natural resources. We believe that this is something states should do. What we are changing is we believe that instead of yeah, the state taking this money to invest in certain uh, in certain ways in its budget and so on, it should distribute it directly to the citizens as dividend. It will be a an equal dividend to each citizen, on, uh, to each man, woman, and child in the country. This is basically uh, the, uh, what we're standing for. We, uh, we're uh, very happy to have NGOs, uh, external NGOs, coming to monitor exactly what the earnings are and that this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the incomes are, and that these incomes are actually distributed to the uh, to people in this way. Um, uh, obviously, we still we, uh, we're still supportive of having international companies come in and do, uh, being, uh, the work being outsourced to them to mine, find these resources, and so on. But whatever should have gone to the state should go to the individuals. I'm going to have three main points. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about Sorry. why direct investment is just a second. Why direct investment is more is better in this specific uh, in this specific context of developed countries than uh, than. Uh, indirect investment through government. Secondly, I'm going to talk to you about why this dividend is likely to massively improve people's lives. And I'm going to talk to you about trust and buy-in in the state, why this significantly increased on our side of the house. Before that, yes. Okay, so just to clarify, between like state-owned enterprises and private ones, you're taking like a substantial chunk from both of them and redistributing it through dividends? No, we take it, no, we take exactly what is being taken today in terms of uh, in terms of taxation from this, uh, from this. Instead of giving it to the state budget, we're merely distributing it directly to citizens like a company would do with its earnings. Let's talk about why it is the, uh, uh, <coughs> this is better in a direct uh, manner. Because in developed countries, we acknowledge that there is a, uh, there is an, a very significant uh, contribution in the notion of the indirect development, uh, the indirect investment in the public through developing infrastructure and so on. However, we say specifically in developing countries, this is incorrect for three main reasons. For four main reasons. Firstly, we say that significant corruption is something that's, that's uh, <coughs> a characteristic of many of these states. Why is this the case? Firstly, because of weak political institutions, weak institutions of oversight, that allow for over, uh, public oversight. Note also that people having less access to things, uh, to things like education and to access from opposition bodies to things like media and the, uh, their ability to criticize the government means that, you are, have, uh, that people have much less of an, uh, of an awareness on where this money goes. It is therefore very tempting, firstly, to just take the money for, to within the country. No, we take, uh, take the case of Nigeria, for example, where it has huge oil re revenues from oil. However, by estimates, the state has uh, about five hundred billion dollars have been stolen along the years from the government. Uh, from the government, note this sum in itself is more than the, the the entire direct investment in foreign aid to Africa up to this date. We're saying this is critical in the way in, in this uh, in the sense of corruption and how this uh, this affects it. Secondly, we're saying that even if states that manage their funds well, there is an issue of discrimination against certain groups, whether it's it's ethnic issues, the, uh, and ethnic clashes and conflicts between different groups. Or whether it's, uh, for example, patriar uh, patriarchal uh, notions that men deserve more rights than women, we're saying this is also a very prevalent pro uh, problem, and therefore we want an equal distribution in this sense as well, to have everyone ag gain exactly the same. Thirdly, we say that even if, the, uh, if these problems do not exist, the, um, uh, the public doesn't see 
the, uh, the money actually going to, uh, to it. it see, what it sees through indirect investment is the notion that a, the government, that someone else comes in and takes resources, takes the oil, t uh, mines the land. These people work in those, uh, in those mines and, uh, and in these uh, projects. However, the incomes are come to something, they don't see the direct link between that and the government actually spending on them. What does this lead to? This leads to things like, uh, to more, note that a lot of the rebellions and the armed rebellions in Africa today are over resources. Boko Haram, the uh, main cr call for arms for people, is specifically the notion that uh, the natural resources are being deprived from us. This is why they attack oil, uh, oil tanks and oil pipes as a main, a main uh, agenda. So we're saying this, uh, this also changes, obviously, when you have direct investment in people where they themselves see the money coming, to their, coming into their pockets. I'm going to extend on this when I talk about state buy-in. Let's talk about why this massively improve, this is mass going to massively improve people's life, this direct investment. Because uh, firstly, we say that people simply know how to manage, they know their own needs much better than any government could ever, uh, could ever know. Specifically a government with pro corruption problems, but, ge but more generally. People know if a person needs this money now in order to ed uh, for education, or another person, education is simply not important to him because he's, his family is starving, or because, he's, uh, or because there, there's an issue of, uh, of illnesses, of malaria, or something of this sort in this area, the people are more able, and, uh, more able to act upon that and to act quickly upon that. And we say acting quickly is critical in places where you have cases of famine, where you have cases of, uh, when you have cases of, uh, <coughs> uh, of infections and all these sorts of things, meaning we can save lives uh, directly, but uh, moreover, people can unionize, can come together and create infrastructure together on a municipal level, on a local level, and we're saying this infrastructure is likely to be more suited to the needs of those individual people. Secondly, we say that just having the ability for some startup money in order to, have, uh, in order to be able to build your own business, to gain education, is usually important in being able to financially develop those countries in the future. We're saying there's much more likely of that happening on our side of the house. Before I go on, closing. Incentives for corruption are endemic on either side. If you can advocate for uh, oversight, why is it that it wouldn't be just as effective on our side, given it's more centralized than monitoring every Thank national payment? We say it is possible for the government to oversee, to oversee companies. It is not e as easy for the government to oversee itself. This is what we're changing. This is the, uh, the change that we're making in this sense. Let's talk about, uh, about buy-in and trust in the state. Because we say that, yes, a major call to arms for, re uh, for rebellion uh, groups and so on is the notion that the state can, uh, controls resources and it, it does not distribute it to the people in need. Why, is this, uh, why does this change under our side of the house? Because obviously when the state has, uh, has the control over those resources, it is able to provide for people who are considering joining Boko Haram much more resources because it, uh, because it has the control over these territories, it has the control, the, the direct control over, uh, over these resources, so people end without the notion of having to risk their lives or join a murderous organization. We're saying this is critical in, in cutting down the recruitment of these organizations also having more natural resources because my, the, because gaining natural resources is, is hampered by the, uh, by the presence of such organizations, by the fact that there's much higher risk cost in operating in these states. This is something that changes on our side of the house. Moreover, in general, in states where you can't oversee public law in all places, so trust in the system is specifically important in gaining taxation in people being able to buy into the state. We're saying for all these reasons, we are proud to propose. Thank you. We believe that the issue with uh, natural resources rich countries, especially the ones that they've characterized and with booming corruption, with governments not accountable, is that if you actually give out these payments to the people, you're not going to decrease those uh, structural flaws. We believe that these structural flaws can only be eliminated in the case where the state actually has the aggregate supply of money to deal with them, not when it's dispersed person by person, and not when we don't actually see uh, any of the benefits in the long term for the people. So what I'm going to do in my speech is I'm going to talk about how it's important to find finance the state and use this money uh, to provide for long-term things. And then uh, second, I'm going to talk about how it's a silencing mechanism for, for both democratic reform and for uh, any, any long-term reforms. But before that, a few rebuttals. 
So they come up to us, opening government comes up to us and says, well, because there's so much corruption, you see $5 billion pocketed by Nigerian politicians that effectively, like, it's important to share these, uh, this money with people, and then there's going to somehow be less per uh, corruption. So we see that there are several flaws with this logic, because, like, if you characterize these countries as so corrupt in the status quo, we don't really see how that's going to disappear. So exactly what you're going to have is a country that is still very corrupt, but doesn't have the money and resources needed to deal with this corruption, ladies and gentlemen. Corruption is not something that goes away when there is go there's a government that comes in and says, hey, we actually disagree with corruption now. There are a lot of governments that do disagree with corruption, but do not have the funds to deal with the law enforcement uh, that is corrupt, with, the, uh, with whatever bureaucracy that are corrupt, and we believe that you need a lot of resources to actually fight that. In fact, we would, uh, we would argue that it takes off pressure for people, for governments to fight this corruption in this case, because it gives you the perception, the ordinary citizen, the perception that, hey, it's now good, it's being shared with me, therefore, perhaps, it's less possible for these po uh, people to pocket the money, whereas that still happens. Sit down. So, second thing is helping minorities. So, there's a very uh, simple response to this, is that we see that these benefits are best marginal, because what you're doing is you actually have a blanket policy. You're helping everyone in this case. So, what you're giving the money to as well is the very rich people that are doing the oppressive in this case. If you have groups like Boko Haram, for example, that are conflicting over these natural resources, two things. First of all, you pay them too, because you didn't really specify the policy of who you were paying in this case. They're citizens as well. They get the money. You finance those warlords that are actually doing these infightings in the country. And second thing, ladies and gentlemen, there's always going to be incentive for terrorist groups with these kinds of agendas to take over the natural, uh, natural resources in the country. We don't see how that is going to disappear, even if they're sharing in this case. So we disagree with that. And the last point is how they say that people do know their needs whether it's short-term or long-term, and that it's best to leave the people to decide for themselves of what they need for their family and for themselves as individuals. So one response to that. So even if we agree with that, that they do know their needs, the thing, the good thing about the state having this money is that there is an economy of scale and that because you don't disperse this money over, uh, over millions of individuals, you can actually do some meaningful things with that. So because you can aggregate the money in this case, you actually have investments, meaningful investments for people. And that leads me to my uh, first argument. But before that, short closing. Sir, you can have meaningful investments, but when those same corrupt people are the government who is getting the money, who exactly is supposed to fight the Right, so like it's a chicken and the egg problem because you can't get rid of the corruption as well if you, if you give away the money that can be used to fight this corruption. But we're going to talk about even in the worst case scenario of the very corrupt countries, it is still better to have this money in the country's hands because we still believe that they have incentives to, uh, to, to make the state better. But before that, financing the state of how that is important. So we believe that their infrastructure projects such as housing, such as building hospitals, such as improving law enforcement are immensely costly. What the proposition, what the opening government said is that they would give most of the taxes, for example, that you get from private corporations such as Shell in Nigeria to people, so which effectively leaves these countries barren of funds. They do not have any money. And mind you, ladies and gentlemen, is that these countries actually only usually rely on the natural resources, on the taxes that they get from these companies or direct or, dire or getting these, uh, the, the money directly from these things. This is the only comparative advantage, for example, for Angola or for Nigeria is the money that they have and the money that they get from these mining industries, from the oil industries, because they simply can't compete on other terms, for example, in trade and stuff like that, with bigger regional powers or with Western powers. So we believe that you're taking away the only comparative advantage through which they can aggregate enough money to give that money, to Im implant that money into infrastructure projects. Now, why is that important? Because like, even if we believe in the best case scenario that you have, the people knowing what they need and having that $100, right, from the oil industry in Nigeria, because like, obviously there's a lot of people, so there's not going to be that massive, um, a massive improvement in their uh, quality of life. We see that still, if you get sick with cancer or if you catch some other disease, there's simply not going to be enough facilities for you to be taken care of. So regardless of what the, the money that you have in the short term is not going to help you fight the structural problem. Same for law enforcement. If you have a faulty law enforcement that doesn't care about actually upholding the laws in the country, what you're doing now, ladies and gentlemen, is you're not making the money available for the state to deal with these structural problems. Is that we believe that actually these countries are not doing well just because of their relative position 
in, in the world or because of the corruption that is massive in these countries per se, but because there's such structural flaws that are not enabling them to take care of the citizens when they're in most dire need. We believe that the state, in some instances, is responsible, is the only act responsible for bringing in those structural changes, such as building more hospitals, such as bringing more, uh, building more schools and stuff like that. And you're taking those, and you're taking that advantage from the state away by dispersing the money through individuals, hoping that they will make the, deci the right decision for themselves. But we believe that because you are hoping that they will make the right decision for themselves, even if that's the case, they're not going to have channels through which they can improve their lives in the long term because the state no longer has the money to deal with that. So that is the first problem in financing the state. The second issue is that we believe that it's a silencing mechanism. So we see, yes, even if we take the worst case scenario of a super corrupt country that is undemocratic and doesn't give a crap about their citizens, we still believe that we run into a problem that we believe that there's still an incentive for these countries to somehow improve the lives of their constituents. We believe that from a richer population, the country is going to get more revenue, A. B, you don't want people to, up, uh, to rise up against you in violent revolt. What you're doing with these dole outs, though, and it's exactly what happened after the Arab Spring in like Oman, Saudi Arabia, and stuff like that, is that the, uh, is that the leaders of those countries doled out money to people to silence their dissent, to actually, it, 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 it makes the people not see the structural flaws in the country that they have, and because in the short term they feel happier, they are not, they're not as incentivized to deal with the corruption issues in this case. On our side of the house, though, we see that even if you don't give this, uh, these money to the people, we still see that there's some incentive for the state to make, in the worst case scenario, to make changes within the state for their population. But we also see that there's a stronger incentive because the population can demand more of those changes in the case because they're simply not bribed in this instance. So for all these reasons, we beg you to oppose. In this debate, you should ask yourself, what is the hell to specifically these countries? And here is the key sentence of this debate. Governments, and specifically the government interest, should be aligned with the interest of their citizens, and it should be governments should be dependent upon their citizens. This is a key sentence in this debate. What do we mean? Let's give an example even before going into a battle. Russia currently has a strong economy without dependence on its citizens. How come? It has a lot of resources that it utilizes in order to finance crazy things that the state does. When the state has no dependency on the education of its citizens, on the infrastructure of its citizens, when the state can become addicted to the money, which is coming from specifically natural resources in these cases, it becomes the fact that the state's interests can no longer be aligned with the interests of its citizens. And going on the first level, it shows you that there is no interest to actually develop infrastructure or hospitals that the entire population can use. On the deeper level, it can show that it can do batshit crazy, uh, batshit crazy policies as what is happening in many developing countries in the world. Let's start with the battle. I'm going to, to invest a lot of time showing how exactly Sorry. this works. Firstly, regarding Boko Haram and what they're saying, we're not going to give money to people who are proven to be part of Boko Haram, obviously. However, less of an incentive to actually join Boko Haram in the long term if a lot of people are going to be more complacent, right? If we're going to be able to silence them to the extent that they're not going to become terrorists, it's not that the state is going to be more stable, thus allow more development of infrastructure, etc. Secondly, there is going to be less of a reason for these for these organizations to actually utilize public anger, as we explained in our point, which was not rebutted, and unfortunately we will not have a chance to really respond to it, because what we say that a lot of the times the fight are over resources, thus the incentive to actually create new book of harms is even lesser. Then they say, but listen, it is important that the state will have finance. We agree to an extent. We agree that the state should be financed by the taxes of its citizens. I'm going to spend a lot of time specifically on that. We're going to argue on the fact of whether it's actually likely on their side that hospitals are going to actually be built. But moreover, a comparative should be made here to the fact that citizens are still getting money. It is not compared to the fact that the money is just vanishes randomly. Why does it matter? A, because we simply do not accept the fact just blindly that giving people money if they don't have enough, uh, enough power to actually live through the winter is less important than building a central hospital for a village. We just simply do not accept this fact. Secondly, some 
people do not enjoy the money or the, or, or, or the, or, or the infrastructure from the state. Case in point, women in education, case in point, minorities in access to actually doctors in many of these areas. The fact that we're going to be able to allow to divide it to more people is better. We get a challenge in a POI from closing opposition, but if they are corrupted, how are we going to oversee specifically that? Note, it is vastly easier on the other side of the house to oversee what is going to happen with the money when we know specifically that we're going to have an external NGO and we're perfectly fine with that in all developing countries to see that the money is going to come from there, the shallow whatever is now going to be able to go through the financial expenses and to see how much money actually came to the country that the money is going to be allocated to the citizens, rather than a mechanism in which the money is first absorbed by the state and then disappears to many branches of the government and to many corrupted mid-level officials who just vanishes in many other levels. It's just way more easier, obviously corruption exists on both sides, just way more easier to have oversight on the fact that it's more centralized under our side of the house. Moreover, the fact that citizens are now going to have more money to buy things as medicine if they're sick in the winter says that the incentives to actually build a hospital is going to be cheaper for the state because a market is going to be created. We say it's going to happen on our side of the house as well. Regarding the second point of the silence, the silencing mechanism, A, it is not sustainable. I'm going to deepen it in a second. Why does it matter? Because Egypt, which is using this mechanism, is running out of money, which means that right now it is more reliant upon things as developing aid from the West and has to do things as improving the education of its Muslim population. This is an excellent thing. All of these mechanisms are not sustainable because it's safe, it's trying to silence people are just eventually going to run out of the money. Secondly, the fact that less violence is going to occur because of silence mechanism sounds actually great. Substantive. Note, here are the things which actually matter in this debate in terms of things that are inherent to all things. Right? We care the fact that low levels officials are going to have corruption. We care the fact that some, that some states in these manners have crazy IR immediate interest right? because they are still state. The government cannot have complete control over what is happening. It tends to, 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 to be sustainable in these places it tends to be in order to prioritize shorter methods just being survived. It tends to not don't prioritize things as women working in many of these cases because it can find that actually on the, your side more, more have an, even more of a silencing of the population because it can push crazy agenda. It has more people that is not incorporating minorities. It can do things which are not reliant upon the population. We say that on the our side, education, infrastructure, and cooperation of minorities are way more likely. Why is this the case? Money that doesn't come from the citizens allow the government to have its own, to be its own agent and to have its own agenda. This is a sentence to mark in this debate. Here is a crucial differentiation from developed countries and developing countries. How come? The fact that in developing in developed countries, we have other mechanisms of supervision of the state, as the fact that we have, uh, that we have free media, as the fact that we have constitutions which are stable most of the time, as the fact that we have stable oppositions that can come and outcry in these cases means that even if the money, if the government has more money, it is still able to do these things with the supervision of the state in case the state does something which is insane. In the cases of new countries which do not have sustainable infrastructure that are, that are that, 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 that have some sensitivity to things as future evolutions, that have many outcry groups that are going to take and infringe upon the state, the mechanism simply does not exist. I want a pure I know if Okay, no engagement. Your yes. characterization of these corrupt states is correct, that still corruption will exist, but whatever excess money you get from whatever trade or no, whatever no. natural resources is going to go to the people. No, no, we it. say it is vastly A, more easier to supervise upon the money, B, people are just going to know, you know what, another differentiation, people are just going to know better what to do with the money in many of these cases, because if you don't have constitutional arguments, or the media, or people that have accessibility, they're just going to know better how to spend the money, because the government has no way to actually collect the information about what is necessary in a remote village, or just getting more money is actually a better spending than assuming that somewhere a hospital is needed and a market is going to be created yet again. Why does it matter yet again? Because note, a despot can now have used the money in order to do things as going into an adventure in a foreign state, like what has happened in Africa in the cases of what is happening in South Africa in the past, like what is happening in Russia in many of the cases right now. The fact that the state can do these things without the consideration of its citizens is something which actually changes massively on our side of the house. How come? Because every policy that is now going to actually be passed is reliant upon the, the state having more money, i.e. being able to finance itself throughout more mechanisms is going to be it's going to be incorporated with the fact that the citizens have to be more dependent upon your human resources rather than your natural resources. Why does it matter? Because if you're dependent upon your human resources, you by definition have to invest more money in education. You by definition have to invest more money in incorporating these minorities. You by definition have to invest more money in creating the infrastructure. Why does this matter? Because in the long term, the chances of using this money and utilizing it into creating, into creating the fact that, um, that a middle, that a middle, um, um, not mid, middle income, the, command, the middle uh, class is going to be created for this are vastly higher on the, our side. Note, it is A, better because people are going to spend the money and B, just having the money is bad. We beg you, 
on every level to propose. Mr. Speaker, let's recognize that this is a fundamentally a debate about long-term versus short-term interests. But more than that, we're talking about states that are not uniform in nature. What we get from open opposition is a case that depends on a characterization of developing nations that like, they somehow have revenue coming from some other place, but not quite enough that they'll be able to finance things in the long term if they end up you know, giving dividends to their populations. Let's recognize that we're talking about a huge range of countries. We're talking about places like Botswana, which relies on ext uh, the extraction of diamonds, Nigeria and oil, Russia and natural gas, a huge range and plethora of countries that have very different demographies, very different income revenues, and very different levels of poverty and development. Insofar as what they tell us on constructive, the worst case scenario from them is that they hamstring states to not being able to do anything su substantive because a huge chunk of their revenue is now lost from their budget. That is the worst case scenario that we, that we propose to in opening government, in opening opposition, we never heard a response to. Their best case scenario is that we take away some of the money that would fuel corruption. But there's a few critical impacts that they never responded to. First, that they're still left with corrupt structures and bad governance that they never indicated to us or gave us reasons why those would suddenly dissolve or disappear. But secondly, we told you that what would happen in their world, in the, in the best case scenario, that often they would just outsource corruption, which we think is actually worse. Because we think it's tougher to tackle when you empower cronyism and local patronism net, patronage networks at the local level. So if somehow they have a magical NGO network that can like oversee the distribution of uh, like dividend payments to like over a billion people in the developing world, we think that that like, magical structure could equally be used to oversee like, the fair use of revenues of oil in Nigeria. So we think that that's an insufficient assertion to like, buoy their claims they're making. But finally, we think that in their best case scenario, we also lose any and all trickle down effects of investments that do happen in places like Nigeria, despite the amount of money that is in fact given to corruption. We think that there is in fact uh, things like infrastructure and resource development that is in fact invested in from revenues brought from uh, revenues uh, taken from natural resource extraction. That is simply a fact. Let's deal with a few more of the substantive things coming from opening government before we get into the final substantive from OO. No thanks. So what they tell us is that you know we have a lack of information of where the money goes in places like Nigeria and why you know like it, even if it's well managed, the money is used to discriminate against certain populations. We think that they didn't give us any substantial reasons why any of that would change. But more than that, what we told you in response was that it's important to recognize that a lot of the things that we need to have access to in terms of healthcare, education, infrastructure, employment rely on aggregated public goods that need the government to invest in them specifically because market forces will never be strong enough to allow the private sector, even if it was capable of doing so, in, of investing in these kinds of goods. So even if you're a woman who is suddenly able to use her $100 a month to like access education, which were unclear on why like patriarchal norms will suddenly disappear in their world, we think that it's problematic because your state is unable to invest in the infrastructure and goods required to provide you with those things in the very first place. What they tell us next is about like Boko Haram and this red herring, right? They just tell us, oh, well, we just won't give money to them, and there'll be less reason to join Boko Haram and less reason to start Boko Haram in the first place. Like, it's unclear why like insurgencies would not start when you can still take all the profit from like like pilfering, pilfering like revenues from oil pipelines anyways, but we think that's not very relevant. But more than that, we think that the opportunity cost is massive in this debate, in the, insofar as that like a place like Nigeria, their characterization is inaccurate. Like Nigeria has a burgeoning middle class, right? So like what this means is that you're giving, and but like admittedly also a lot of poor people. But what happens is with like a blanket policy of paying dividends is you are giving a huge chunk of money to a bunch of people who really don't need that money. What that means is the opportunity cost of giving that money to those people is the fact that you can no longer spend that money on investments that are far more higher returns for people who need them the most, being the most deprived and the chronically poor. When they tell us that like, you know, we're more likely to suppress people because there's a lack of accountability in the developed world and it's just, easy, just easier to supervise, we th we're, like, it's unclear to us why any of these arguments they're making are substantively different in their world in terms of the structures that continue to exist as well as the cronyism that they empower at the local level. Let's talk about the third substantive argument on side government. Before that, yes. So all continues to assume that more hospitals are going to be built. Although what we put in our case is that if you do not have a, you do not have 
point of the human resource that if you're less likely that the money is going to be better that way, this is why you should give it uh, as a, a Okay, a, listen, like countries like Nigeria, like despite the characterization that they take some of the money for corruption, like it is simply a fact that they use a lot of the money for things like infrastructure, whether it be to like drive roads and shipments to the shipping ports that they need to like get their oil to market, which benefits society at large. But they also do invest that money in hospitals and things like schools. Like even if it's not optimal, there is something that we have that we get from the policy of having this, uh, you know, like contained within a budget that we don't have under their world. Like it is not reality to pretend that like Nigeria and like, you know, all the Gulf states and all African states take 100% of the profits and like pocket yeah, all of the money to like for, for corrupt means. That's simply not what happens in the real world. Let's talk about why this policy being a finite one has really terrible implications. Something that was actually conceded by opening government, we'll point that out where it's relevant. So what we think is that like it's obvious that natural resources are a finite resource resources and will cease to exist at some point. This is accelerated by the fact that we just reached COP21 where a lot of these countries have new obligations not to extract a lot of oil from the ground. What the implication of this is that the payoff policy is also a finite one. So we think that like, okay, all policies are finite. Why is this a bad thing? Because we think that it creates a very specific set of ex expectations from the population that are damaging in the long term. Why? Because of the idea of relative deprivation, that when you put a population in a situation where suddenly they're getting like $100 a month, it puts them in a cognitive situation where in the absence of that money, the, like, the, the, the relative deprivation that they feel is pretty significant. This is exactly what happened in Egypt, right? Where like for many, many, many years, the government subsidized bread prices. And suddenly when that policy dropped off, there was massive chaos, revolt, and, up, and, and uprisings. We think that in the long term, that's more damaging for the state when you have to you know, suddenly deal with all this conflict that's, uh, that's created by the fact that populations were used to getting payouts for you know, 10, 20 years. But the consequence here, importantly, is that in those 10, 20 years that have passed, you haven't had the necessary resources to invest in the kinds of infrastructure and resources that you could fall back on to say like listen we've still invested in these things that are good for you that allow like, allow you to be empowered allow you to reach an education and all these kinds of things so what happens when the money runs out is that people have like marginally improved their standing in society maybe in the absence of things like schools and, and you know hospitals and these kinds of things but by and large you now have a state where people are very very angry precisely because the absence of a policy that existed for about 20 years without the kind of hard infrastructure and policies that would otherwise enable that country to actually transition towards a more stable, productive society. We think that's really damaging and something that happens explicitly and exclusively when we implement the policy on their side of the house. We think that on top of that, this feeds into local cronyism and patronage networks, which we think temporarily empowers them as damaging for stability because then those groups are used to having this kind of money flowing through their coffers, and we think that's incredibly damaging for things in the long term. We've given you ample reasons and evidence why we need this money to invest in state building in the long term and why that's actually better off for a majority of citizens in these kinds of states. We are very proud to oppose. Thank you. This idea that it creates a government incentive to invest in infrastructure at the point at which the government funds are dependent on funds taxed from the people. Opposition disagree with them on two notions. One, the idea that it, like, that, that um, uh, infrastructure can come anywhere but the government. And two, on the idea that this is not sustainable long term. We're going to extend then on two points. One, we want to widen the scope of this debate because we don't think it's applicable only to corrupt countries. We think there are many developing countries who are not corrupt and we think this is applicable there as well, furthering the imp uh, impact on government bench. But two, we want to expand specifically on how you create a government that is beneficial to its people because the 
hole that opening government leave is to say we have corrupt individuals who are then incentivized to help their citizens. We want to show how giving more power to the people creates a situation in which the citizens can force the government to help them out. Those are my two arguments. Before that, two points of rebuttal. One on this notion of unsustainability. Note this is true on either side of the house, that like, it's not sustainable to rely your finances on something, a resource that is finite. However, what we say is, and this will be in my analysis, at the point at which you allow individuals the capital in order to invest in themselves and in their environment, you create a sustainable long-term situation, which under their side of the house, they by no means get. Two on the idea that, no Sorry. thank you, that infrastructure only comes from government. Like, we'll talk about that more later on why government's more likely to do that, but just like a point of fact, generally speaking, the infrastructure in these country comes from people like Homes for Africa or whatever, and various sure. NGOs that work very hard and put their own charity money into building infrastructure, into building roads, into building hospitals. So it's just entirely untrue that it only comes from government. We sure. argue it often doesn't come from government. First argument on why this is true also on non-corrupt government. We say the problem in developing nations is in the infrastructure that the governments have in order to control and be informed about the needs of their citizens and about what proper investments are. What are these uh, um, <clears throat> infrastructure problems? These problems come to, hold on, no thank you. Okay. These problems come from things like in order to, 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 to be aware of what, what to develop, you need to have a massive slew of properly trained bureaucrats who invest various cases on a case-to-case -case basis to see whether or not it's worth investing in that form of business. It's things like having an agency within the government that is like economically uh, 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 invested, in, that is informed economically regarding the, 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 the state of the, uh, of the economy both outside of the country and within the country. All of these things are things that underdeveloped, uh, that, that developing nations often don't have within Sorry. their government. This means that even at the point at which they want what is best for their citizens, they're often incapable of making the decision on a better way, right? This is analysis to something that Don and Ayal state to you. Now, secondly, we're going to go into how the citizens can turn this into long-term profit. Before that, second. Do you believe that international institutions that give out loans and various advice and guidance to developing economies like the World Bank are essential to a successful development or even useful to it? Absolutely, yes. Now, we say this gets much better on our side of the house. Second point. How do economies in general and specifically within developing nations work? Because we think the essential problem here, and this is a problem that goes all the way down to infrastructure, is that the individuals comprising of the society are at far too low a starting point in order to create a beneficial free market. This is analogous to people growing up in disadvantaged neighborhoods within Western society who are often then not able to enter this great free market because they don't have the necessary starting capital, no thank you, in order to capitalize on business ideas. Note this is further perpetuated by the fact that even in like places where these uh, th th these investments could exist, you often have structural problems like central banks being corrupt themselves and not handing out uh, um, 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 money to people, or being uninformed, like we said earlier, about whether or not investments are good, and therefore making uninformed and bad decisions about what should and should not be invested in. No, thank you. How do we change this on our side of the house? The, crucial, the most crucial thing is not that you give individuals money in order to buy food, in order to buy medicine, but rather you give individuals capital and groups of individuals capital in order to perpetuate an economy with, and a market within their local environment. What does this mean? It means that the individual or the group collective of a neighborhood can now open that first supermarket in the village in the, in, in the outs, in the, you know, on, the, on the outskirts. Why is this so crucial? Two reasons. One, we say this is localized solution that builds long-term capital. Two, we say, this is 
further, no, thank you, this further develops an economy in, 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 by, by franchising. Because at the point at which you have, A, pinpointed solutions to local problems, and B, a creation of capital that Sorry. perpetuates, no, thank you, that perpetuates itself within the needs, because as opening points out, the individuals also now have more buying power to, pro to, to support these, uh, these industries. You get what you ended up getting in India when they started opening up the market, which is franchising of local things, uh, of, of local businesses that create cheaper economies for everyone around them and for the uh, uh, re like revolving uh, communities as well. Why is all of this so crucial? Two reasons. One, on the idea of like infrastructure is only built by government, we say the ability for individual citizens to influence the government is only at the point when those individuals themselves have a stake, a claim they can make towards the government, the ability to influence the government. Dan and Ayal say the government will just change their mind. We say at the point at which people have buying power and, 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 and economic power, they can force the government into changing. We see that in a shift in India and in China at the point at which they started having higher GDPs towards democracy. Nope, they're not great, but they've get, gotten better over time because the individuals are better informed, better financed, and can demand their rights. Secondly, we say at the point at which you build localized businesses which then franchise out that exactly creates the long-term sustainable economy that on either side of the other side of the house you never get just with natural resources. We beg you to propose. <laughs> I'd like to start by addressing the characterization of what the clash of this debate is from the opening government. So I agree with the closing government that this debate should not be purely about uh, corrupt institutions and how we solve for those. But even if you do think that's where the primary clash is, I do not believe that opening government has been in any way uh, non-disingenuous about how this ought to function. Because the fact is that sufficient incentives definitely exist within the status quo to demand proper development from these kinds of institutions. The fact is that the entire premise of the Bretton Woods organizations, the IMF and the World Bank, is that they demand fair investment, good government governance and people actually putting money into the economy rather than just being rapidly extracted. So the fact is that, first of all, this debate has to be about uh, not just a truism, that it would be nice if a benevolent policy was put together by people who are not benevolent, but rather which kinds of modes of development and participation in international institutions actually lead to the best kinds of long-run outcomes. However, even if you do think this is about corrupt nations, we're going to prove to you why it's exactly in those situations where those people have not been playing ball with the World Bank, do not have good governance, are exactly the kinds of individuals where an annuity to citizens does not solve the core problems uh, for all those reasons. Um, sure. So the entire assumption by the state right now is that the state is completely dependent upon getting money from the World Bank. This is obviously not true in many of the cases and you can just replace it if taking money from the resources. Oh, no, 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 that's not, that, that's not what I'm saying. The World Bank is not just a sheer source of loans and its only participation is just create cycles of dependency. That used to be true. That's not the status quo anymore, right? The whole nature of structural adjustment has changed. But what are we going to tell you about the World Bank about our side of the house? The point of the World Bank is that it oversees investment by these nations because it understands that localized governments and governments in poor nations are not necessarily good at predicting the results of development. So the whole point of, of tying things to loans and having people have access to capital markets through the World Bank is the World Bank gives you predictions as to which kinds of development will actually be effective. So the problem is that uh, a, a direct basic income is not something that the World Bank has as an actual policy they would ever support for very good reasons. Because the fact is that it's, it's, it's just naturally inflationary. It doesn't change the core problems of the economy. And if it's tied to resource extraction, it's massively dependent upon commodity fluctuations, which means that people are dependent upon the random vagaries of the market. This is why the whole point of structural adjustment is actually changing the fundamental infrastructure of the society rather than giving cash payouts to individuals. But one of the harms of this then is that this kind of policy will necessarily alienate these developing nations from the Bretton Woods organizations because it's going against their entire premise of what they think proper development ought to be, which means if you think of world, the World Bank as one, a good means of demanding there be not corruption and a means of instituting the government, two, of actually giving people the kind of bridge loans to develop the kind of infrastructure that both sides believe in, but three, is actually a good thing for these people to have any kinds of access to. The fact that this could potentially alienate people from the World Bank by not being the kind of economics that they believe in is particularly potentially a huge harm on their side of the house. But 
even if you don't believe any of that argumentation is true, the fact is that what we can show you on our side of the house is that necessarily there is not actually a means of creating a long run on their side either way. So why do we think dividends are a bad thing to tie to resource extraction, section area of extension? So the fact is resource extension should always have a long-term policy plan for a lot of reasons. So first of all, as we've already talked about, it's going to be a finite source of income. But more importantly, there's the problem of the inevitable volatility of commodities, that there can be crash and crashes in markets. For instance, what's going on in the global economy right now? China's no longer designing to build infrastructure, which means everyone that was having raw earth minerals or things like iron ore and basing their economies upon that are having massive tanks in those, those commodities. So why is it bad then to be tying the profits of those commodities to a basic income for individuals? Because that income dries up, you have massive instability in the ability for those individuals to actually have some kind of economic uh, solvency. But additionally, the big problem is that the alternative on our side is that you actually have a reasonable use of that money towards a looking towards the long term and investing it gradually. What are the things they have to deal with on their side of the house? The fact is that if people become dependent upon this basic income and it starts to falter, their response is going to be extract more, right? Double down, find a better way of us getting this money because they become dependent upon it, which means there's political incentives to do exactly what you're not supposed to do in that situation. The best thing to do with commodity volatility is to slowly sell commodities over a longer frame of time and look towards the long run and be willing, in fact, to do, uh, for instance, what the OPEC nations are doing, which is accept low prices in the short term and sell less when their supply and demand mismatches. But when people have their basic income tied to it, there's obvious political incentives then to not have this kind of wise governance due to the very things they talk about. So the whole premise of the closing government extension is actually tremendously bad for their side, right? Because it's exactly the people's power which they're demanding a kind of economics which is far more unstable and bad for their long-term development, which is exactly why the World Bank would never sponsor something like this. I'll come take your POI. Just to be clear, you think it's better that the government spend volatile money on building half the bridge that then dries up than for individuals who have enough starting capital to build their own that's a terrible POI. Obviously, you're going to be able to complete a variety of infrastructure projects when you're making billions of dollars of things like iron ore or oil. It's not like you do all the projects like in a video game at once and then you only complete 50% of all of them and they all fall apart. That's not how development works. But you know how it is probably how development works? When you rely on local communities to band their annuity together and then maybe build a hospital due to the charitable actions of anyone. The third thing we want to extend about is that the fundamental collective action problem of infrastructure is conceded to by the entire government bench and then they hope that individuals will then choose to solve it. Obviously, they won't. That's why we have governments. Look, so much of the history of development to Africa has been us giving cash payments to people, has been NGOs providing people food, providing people medicine. If that was the long-term successful development strategy, Africa wouldn't be poor anymore, right? The whole problem of the World Bank, the reason why we do things like structural adjustment is just having money in the economy doesn't solve. It leads to things like inflation. It leads to things like inappropriate forms of investment because individuals aren't good at looking at those things. Their only argument is, well, governments are dumb and bad at it too. That's why they should be used Using the guidance of international institutions that tell them how to invest. But one thing we know is that they'll never tell them to invest or structure their economy in this particular way. So let's look at some of the other arguments they provide to you on their side of the house. So I think it's very interesting that, unfortunately, like the opening government's claim is basically this is a kind of policy that is better than absolutely nothing. We can fiat it happening on our side. Therefore, it's better than the status quo where absolutely corrupt governments are totally terrible. So first of all, we've already outweighed this within the debate, like because we've shown you that the natural political incentives in all kinds of economies are going to be trending towards such a situation situation where this wouldn't necessarily be effective. But additionally, even if you do think that you want to in some way solve corruption with something like this, the fact is that it's fundamentally bad economics. And I think that what we have to rest on on our side of the house is that the problem of development is only ever going to be changed through infrastructure. You need to have capital because capital is the means of wealth that generates future wealth. It changes the roads, it develops the trains, it develops the hospitals that actually mean your society is able to move forward. What they would have to prove on their side of the house is that random individuals through like a strange microfinance situation suddenly get more money and then they have the vision of how to fix their society. That hasn't worked. And if it were to work, it would probably be better to collectivize that money in the hands of a few intelligent people rather than the form of an annuity to every individual. Which means we don't have to defend governments that do nothing with this money and just put it in their pockets. Obviously, there's some kind of middle ground, which is the actual thing opposition is defending. We think that is obviously going to be an intelligent use of this money by governments. It may be inefficient, but there's no way it's nearly as inefficient as both the political insanity of basing your economy on commodities and just hoping that people know how to build a nation from nothing. We're tremendously proud to oppose. Thank you.
While it's true that closing opposition is very much against microfinancing, you know who's not against microfinancing? The World Bank. You know who's not against microfinancing? The Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Economic Prize, which awarded it to the people who started microfinancing in India. What they simply say here is, quite frankly, microfinancing, that's a completely terrible and ridiculous idea. It's much, much better to continue funneling the huge amounts of money we already do under status quo, both through resources and through foreign aid, directly to governments who are so able to develop Africa, which is why Africa, with all the billions of dollars that it's got over the last however many years, is such a burgeoning and amazing economy. We say, quite frankly, let's change the status quo. Let's re-enfranchise the people inside Africa. Let's give them microfinancing to solve their individual needs. And, we will, and that is the way where you get, you get actual development of the economy. That is the way where you get development of politics and political capital that can be used to change the government and solve the corruption that both sides of the House agree, no thank you, is crippling Africa today. And they provide no reason as to why this will not happen tomorrow. So what I'm going to be doing here today is showing, is showing basically why we get better decision making and doing the analysis, the specific analysis of why specifically in developing countries we would rather trust the people with their money rather than the government. No thank you. Because we think a lot of the that is provided here on the op by, the opening, by the opening opposition is reliant on the kind of governments which exist in developed world, and then afterwards we get an extension of the World Bank. So let's go into this. So let's talk about why the government is not necessarily people who are... Well, opening government starts by telling us at the, at the end of the day that they, lurks, they, lack, certain, they lurk, lack certain apparatus in order to make decision making. What Eitel and Gumsen tells you is specifically why we need these kind of apparatus to make long-term investment decisions. All of the things that they want to happen, no thank you, do not happen at the point where there is a lack of information for the government to make their decisions. All of these kind of things only happen when you have governments which, have, which, are highly, uh, which are highly informed and thus able to invest inside the right companies. Note, note, Mr. Speaker, this is what happened in South Korea, for instance, no thank you, where the government had huge amounts of knowledge about which companies to invest in, and this is not what happened on the other side in Vietnam, which had similar amount of financial control, but didn't have the same kind of apparatus and the same kind of bureaucratic infrastructure involved in order to do this. The African countries that they are talking about lack this apparatus. The government can't make this decision, and this is even putting aside the issue of corruption, which the first house talked about a lot, and we say probably is true on both sides of the on both sides of the house, but the decision-making process, no thank you, of non-corrupt governments stays very much the same because they simply do not have the ability to know who they are going to invest in. No thank you. Now, more than that, we hear now suddenly that the World Bank is perfect. Well, here's a couple of things. A, we think the World Bank is run by the first world with their, no thank you, whose money, whose mo a lot of the money is involved in, and who have their own agendas and their own kind of, and their own kind of interest, and we don't think that they're perfect. B, we don't understand why the World Bank will stop funding other things which aren't these foreign, which aren't these oil. No, thank you. All of this analysis is just a complete wash because the World Bank can continue funding and loaning for these governments to invest in the infrastructure that they claim that the government is going to build. So it's a nonsensical argument in that kind, in this, in this sense. More than that, we say that the World Bank also supports microfinancing and has supported this in many different countries around the world so we don't understand why suddenly they'll hate it and stop using it. And also we say, no thank you, that you still have huge amounts of money involved in foreign aid, which can also go into these countries in addition to the loans, in the addition to the loans and the other amounts of money that these people get. Now, what happens here is that you also have the people on the other side of this equation. Now, the people inside these countries are necessarily people who, A, don't have the necessarily capital to begin with in order to invest and engage inside the economy, in order to break out of their threshold. Now, they tell us, oh, but it's... What, giving people money? That's crazy. I mean, no thank you. How, how could this possibly work? Well, actually, most studies done in the developing world prove that the people who are there are far more entrepreneurial than the people inside the developed world. Now, this actually seems quite intuitive. Why? Because the amount in order to create something and to do something different inside these countries, I am far more limited in what I am able to do than the people inside the developed world. More than that, the kind of ability, the, the kind of thing, the kind of uh, things which exist already today, uns uh, already today 
say inside developed countries simply don't exist in the developing. Now, why is it then? Why is it then that these people are not able to then create this entrepreneurial spirit and move it into something which is more, uh, which is more beneficial for us as a whole? The reason for this is a lack of microfinancing. It is a lack of financial capital in order for them to invest in these in themselves and create the kind of businesses and further things that we would like to be involved in. I will take closing. Okay, so the World Bank incentivizes certain behavior by saying, if you don't follow the kind of structure of economy you want, we won't give you loans. This is how they treat economies all the time. Thanks. They make an exception. R right, but A, that in rise in the analysis, the World Bank is against microfinancing, a falsehood. B, we say that they can also continue to invest in the things which they are also able to do, right? If you've changed every, all the different countries developing world and they're now doing financing, then this just doesn't happen. Um, first, do you have something? Sure, right. So the opportunity cost of giving literally, literally all your tax money is huge, right? Many people don't need it. Why is it not better to invest in things like Australia does, which is like loan programs for the poor, right. which are more targeted? Thanks. So A, we already explained to you why these kind of, again, the kind of businesses are unwilling to give loans to these people directly because of the issues of risk that you are talking about. Banks want to be our financial institution. There is a market failure here in that they will not invest inside these poor people because of the risk that you are talking about. We say we, we acknowledge the fact that there is risk here. However, we think at the point at where you are giving, again, the government is providing these kind of things to the people even at a certain loss because in the long term, these people are able to garner this capital and turn it into the kind of developed issues that they need. And then we tell you that once these people are enfranchised and these people have local businesses and local movements, they are then able to affect the government. Because again, all opposition is talking about how the governments are so corrupt. The question is, when do governments stop being corrupt? And Eitan tells you quite well that the reason people stop becoming corrupt is when the people have the ability to create the oppositional voices that the first government wants to talk about and have the ability to eventually, uh, to eventually affect the government and impact them because they are a powerful force in the society. What they are doing is remaining all the money and all the incentives inside the hand of the government who are disincentivized to give it to their people in order that they might change them from within. Thank you very much. So, massive strategic misstep on the part of closing government when you just hear a word and run your entire argument on the idea that microfinance was said as a word and stop listening to the actual arguments that John made. His argument was not that microfinance is analogous to annuities that we're talking about. It was literally like a glib joke about like we're just going to microfinance our way into having productive roads, right? But they stopped listening to the argument. What we're saying is the World Bank and any person who actually listened to this round know that there's a significant difference between targeted loans Loans, which is what microfinance is and is used for specific ends in limited cases as opposed to a universal annuity that's paid equally to all people. The fundamental difference between these things is enormous and disastrous because it means they fundamentally were completely non-responsive to one of the biggest parts of this case. So I want to talk a little bit about corruption. I'm going to talk about then long-term development, why we get it much better. All right. So in terms of corruption, right, I think that we've had a lot of back and forth in the round about how this plays into it. I think that we have to acknowledge it on either side of the house, states that are just completely non-compliant are going to be extraordinarily difficult to be able to handle. I think we're still preferable on opposition at the point that we think that it's a lot easier in terms of just like scale and feasibility to have robust international institutions like the World Bank and IMF actually looking at where that money goes, which is something they're pre relatively well equipped to do, as opposed to like benevolent NGOs at every payout to populations of millions making sure that the sort of corruption that they're worried about and that's endemic on either side isn't happening. Like this is an extraordinarily large scale undertaking it's far more likely to be exploited and be less successful, right? But we tell you that there are instances where corruption isn't as widespread, where there might be some graft because that tends to be part of like basically lots of developing economies and many developed ones, and there's likely to be some sorts of those things, but given there is a large amount of capital, how should we actually direct that? That moves me into the argument about long-term development. So I think that fundamentally all sides agree in this round that long-term development is the fundamental goal rather than just like immediate, like, you know, just paying out to, for immediate higher quality
quality of life for individuals, right? We recognize that long-term development is beneficial, but we have fundamental disagreements about how we get there. One thing we do seem to agree on is that it is true that infrastructure is necessary for long-term development. What is the best case scenario that we get from the gov bench? We get a few different answers to this, right? None of them are sufficient or grounded in reality. They're literally like, look, if you give the money to the people, then they'll just form all these things on like a municipal level. Because you know, if you give people a thousand dollars, they suddenly know how to construct a hospital, have the ability to contract things like large scale road programs. Like literally, what are you talking about? And we're like, this is like, wow, a bunch of people should come together, pool their money and let intelligent people contract. Oh, that's a government, that's sovereignty. Like, yeah, the whole point is that it's much harder for individuals who might not have access to things like, so, like significant financial tools or like contracts that like have a large economy of scale like yeah you want to be able to build roads in a way that is sensible doesn't cost 10 times as much and is funded by uh, like individuals that have no capacity to like they're, like how are they going to be able to enforce that they're not getting totally ripped off like there's a whole disaster of ways that this is completely impractical right so you need to have things like oversight you need to have scale of operation you need to have that capital collected in one place because they don't even tell us why all people would necessarily all buy into this model right like if people are self-interested and their lives are so terrible like maybe they're all just gonna or at least half of people are just gonna like spend it on just like little things that might improve their quality of life like more amounts of food like a, you know a better a better shelter that might be nice for that person in the short term but it doesn't solve for the long term of the country at the fact that if people are self-interested it's the, like I'm intimidated by the idea of trying to do any of these projects because it's an enormous undertaking it's unclear why everyone would pull together rather than just be self-interested and never actually yield those long-term benefits because it seems impractical difficult and a high barrier to entry right um, but they're like, look, the thing is, like, people will just be entrepreneurial because they have entrepreneurial spirits, and if you give them money, then businesses will just, like, rise up from that. The problem is that they don't tell you why this is so fundamentally difficult. is because the fact is you do need infrastructure. Often it's a precursor to any of these things. Recognize literally road deaths in Africa kills more people than malaria. And malaria kills a lot of people, and we could probably use hospitals and treatment for that too, right? Recognize that if you don't have education, if you don't have the capacity for people to have things like literacy or robust math skills or understanding understanding of markets or business savvy, right? All the sorts of things that public services and goods provide. Then when you give them capital, you give them empty money that doesn't allow them to actually turn that into a better life. It only allows them to have like immediate solves to the most pressing problems placed before them, right? Okay, but I think that the next thing that's uh, hugely problematic about they don't engage with the fact that these are widely, wildly volatile assets, right? Recognize that we've seen the way that like the falling prices of commodities over the past year has been extremely difficult in many instances. Why hasn't it been more disastrous in many cases? Because when you have a government that's able to have a long-term plan about sensible extraction and more about how the World Bank helps guide this in a second, right? When you're able to do that and you have it in things like an actual national coffer, you can make sensible adju adjudications about when to extract rather than doubling down when you realize that your yearly payment has been cut in half and you like now rely on that for your entrepreneurial spirit well, you know that you're uh, trying to fund like that's hugely improbable and that means people are less likely to actually invest in those things because it's not reliable and it can vary uh, extremely wildly it also means that you're far more likely to get that like half finished bridge idea that they seem to have right so at the point that it's widely volatile this uh, uh, this fundamentally means that the government would be better situated to be able to have those things in coffers to pay them out over time and be able to actually hedge against those uh, various commodities swings and prices uh, top half what bench assumes that more hospitals will be built? Beginning an analysis of what is likely the governments are going to fail, why middle classes of inclusions ending for the winter are more likely, and I think it's beside the fact that the World Bank actually finances less than 5% of the loans to the government. It's crazy. So I think that this is like, there's a fundamental mischaracterization that like, look, we know that development takes a long time, but it's not like none of these things have happened in these countries, right? Like we're seeing a growing class like in my, Nigeria because of things like policies of the World Bank that they actually were able to comply with and allowed for the resources like oil in the South to actually be hugely beneficial. And you do see greater numbers of schools. You do see that it's a rising economy. Nollywood, the, like the Nigerian Bollywood, right? is one of the biggest, it's the third biggest film industry in the world because there actually is this disposable income because they developed in a sensible way. And there's there's actually roads to drive your film crews on, right? Okay, so recognize that uh, uh, the, 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 the fundamental thing that they didn't engage with is that we tell you that the World Bank recognizes, for all of the reasons we've given you all the way down the op bench, that this is an extraordinarily poor way to organize development. At the point that that's true, it's the, they, they're like, well, the World Bank can just invest in other projects. They can be like, we don't like all this nonsense you're doing. That's not how the Bretton Woods uh, uh, like, uh, organizations work. They look at holistic development and they give you things like loans through the leverage and organization of 
saying you're going to develop in a sensible way. You're not going to do things that are counterproductive or corrupted. And so we don't want to throw money into just what is going to be like a sinking pit of doom because you're not actually following sensible development models, right? Insofar as that's true, we do need the World Bank to help guide, even if they're not giving like the explicit, uh, even if it's not just the loans that they're giving, they are giving the guidance for that significant uh, like uh, uh, improvement in the way that these economies function, as well as there are signifier to things like foreign direct investment and other countries that these countries are worth investing in, that they're growing, that they're part of the international community. Very proud to oppose.